Well, hello and welcome to the Switch It Show here on ESPNCrickInfo.com. I'm Jonathan Harris-Bass and joining me today are Butch, Dan and George. It's the last few hours of 2013 in Australia. We've a few more to go here in Great Britain, but ahead of all the festivities of Hogmanay, it's time to take a fleeting look back at the Boxing Day Test match and, and where it leaves English cricket, really. There's most definitely a, a difference in opinion in the way England should go. I'm going to start with George, the article you wrote on the, the fresh approach required by England. Uh, you you think that the head coach must change why is that reluctantly yes I do um, I would uh, I think he's done a brilliant job and I think in in many ways he might be the best coach there is uh, in the world so that would seem a bit uh, contrary to think that it might be that it may be that his time is up but I think having having seen the team uh, quite closely for, for a period of weeks out here they are uh, They've just come to the end of that that cycle. I think they look very down. I think they look out of ideas, and I think they need I don't know refreshing, rebooting, call it what you will. Um, it would be a hell of a shame to lose Andy Flowers' uh, wisdom and expertise and all the rest of it. But I do think someone else needs to come in and revitalise it. Uh, so I don't, I don't think he's about to be fired, or and I don't uh, and I didn't actually say that he should be sacked either in in that piece. Uh, but I do think that when he looks at it, he will resign, although he denies that currently. Is that something that you agree with, Butch, the, the current situation? Um, no. <laughs> uh, I think, uh, I mean, obviously I haven't been in the position, um, nice as it must have been, to, uh, to have been the, around the team for the last two or three months. But... Um, I do feel that uh, if not Andy Flower, then who? Um, I also feel that uh, that there isn't a, there's a large portion of this that can't be laid at his door. Um, selectors and senior players would be the would be the first place that I'd look. And um, judging from the interviews that he's given, which he, in which he was for him incredibly animated, um, sort of talking about how he wants to. To go on and uh, and take this job forward, um, I would be inclined to let him get on with it, given uh, given his excellent past record. Uh, Dan, I mean, the, the impression you get out in Australia is it one that Andy Flower does still have the hunger to be the, the coach of the England team, or that he's just saying the right things at the right time to keep the job? Well, I think if you if you look at the um the uh, the task that England had ahead of them with these two Ashes series and what what then follows it, there is that opportunity to uh, to to stop and, and refresh and recast things. Um, and you know, Andy would I would imagine think that uh, as a fresher uh, or in a in a fresher frame of mind, he'll be able to uh, to be doing that recasting and that refreshing um, himself with a with a new team and transitioning that with all the knowledge and the expertise that that he has. Um, it's uh, a little bit of a a little bit of a difficult one. I mean, the the um, uh, I think one of the some of the people who really need to be asked really honestly and frankly about it are the are the players themselves. Um, I'd say that uh, that uh, that that Paul Downton in particular would probably want to uh, get a few of the senior players together and talk to them really frankly about the uh, the the continuum under under Andy and um, whether you know. Messages that got through six to twelve months ago are still getting through now. Uh, George, I mean, Paul Downs arrived in Sydney. He's going to be talking with Andy Flower over the New Year period, um, and people have suggested that it would be a, a fairly extraordinary decision by him to sack the head coach as his in in, in his first official week in the job. Um, but at the same time, um, I mean. I mean, what is his discussion going to be with Andy Flower? I mean, as I say, Andy Flower's been saying the right things to the press. You've been hearing the right things from him. But, I mean, reading the body language, does he seem to still have the, the hunger to continue? He's definitely got the hunger to continue. I don't think anyone denies that. Uh, I actually had that conversation with him yesterday. Uh, I don't think that's the question, whether he's got the hunger. Everyone has the hunger to play for England or do what they do to the highest level. It's whether they still think they're the best person for the job. And uh, can he still get the best out of the best players? He should be able to, and it might not be his fault that he isn't, but the fact is they are the best players who are here largely, you know, 
give or take two or three. And England haven't been getting the best out of them for quite some time. And ultimately, that has to the, the buck does stop with him. Uh, it does in terms of selection largely as well. I know that he's not the chief selector, but he has the, 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 the strongest, loudest voice in selection, I think, as well. And um, quite a few things coming home to Rouge. Now, the question you raise about Paul Downton is, um, is really good. It, 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 he can't come in in his first week and make a decision like that about Andy Flower. He's meeting a lot of people. He's not just going to meet Flower. He's meeting the press, funnily enough, uh, for an off-the-record chat, I guess, on Saturday, I think it is. And um, he, he'll talk to loads of people. He'll talk to the players. He'll talk to all sorts of people. But I think you can't expect him to make this decision uh, with so little... Uh, experience behind him at this stage, which is why I think it will be Flowers' decision. Um, uh, but I just think that having seen the way, the sort of listless way they are playing, and uh, Brett, I would have seen a, a lot of England, they, they just look uh, exhausted, jaded, whatever it is, and I just think they need a, a breath of fresh air, which all of it, which sounds quite um, simplistic, but there is someone in place. And what you hear from the players who have been in the ODI sides, sorry, the limited overs sides, is that Ashley Giles, who is clearly going to be the next coach, rightly or wrongly, personally I think he has a lot of good qualities, but rightly or wrongly that is the succession planning that is in place. Uh, they talk of a lighter touch, and he might not be as good a coach as Andy Flower. Again, I, I see the conflict in what I'm saying between Flower is the best coach England have ever had, he might well be the best cricket coach in the world, and saying that it's time for him to go, I see the problem. Uh, but at the same time, it's what is best for the team right now, and I just think they need a little bit of a lighter touch. Uh, but you you played with Ashley Giles, and um, so presumably you know him relatively well. Do, do you think he's the right man for the job and uh, to take over with, with the test side? Um, and also, do you agree with either some of the comments made about George's article about Andy Flower moving on were directed towards the fact that England need a, a coach who is going to preside over all three formats of the game that they play in? Um, yeah, well, starting off with the, with the first part, I mean, that, the one area in which I, that I agree with George is that the, when Andy decided that he was going to step back from the, the limited overs role, that kind of that, that set the alarm bells ringing off for me. In that, um, you know, as soon as you as soon as you relinquish sort of part of your duties of, of what what has been one uh, one big grand job, um, it sort of it speaks of a of a sort of a I don't know a winding down perhaps of your of your mental connection to the job. And and at the time, I, I found it. Um, I found it understandable, but I thought maybe that that was the beginning of the end. Um, you know, I remember when when Nasser Hussain stepped down as 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 captain, handed over the one day captaincy to to Michael Vaughan. That kind of, you know, th then it was only a matter of time before um, Vaughan took over the whole lot. Particularly as the results in one format were better than results in another one. Um, so I can see, you know, I I can see where whereby then. You know, you might sort of then follow that path to its ultimate conclusion and say, well, Ashley Giles is going to be the, the guy waiting in the wings, ready to go come the English summer in May. Um, I've known Ashley Giles since I was probably about eight years old, actually. So, you know, not just having played with him. Um, and he was and he was always always somebody that you kind of... Um, that you kind not... You didn't dismiss. You, he was fantastic. You know, he was always a great fella to have around. Um, you know, was brilliant, brilliantly entertaining in a dressing room. Always made the most of what he what he had. But you kind of, unless he was performing at the time, you kind of almost forgot that he was there. And then, boom! You know, he he made absolutely 100% out of the ability that he had. He changed himself from a seam bowler to a spin bowler, um, and you know, the, then becomes head coach when he finished, which is again something that I never never really saw him doing whilst sharing a dressing room with him. Um, and lo and behold, he becomes a, you know he's, he's an England he's an England coach. Um, so on that score, I would say I wouldn't I wouldn't sort of pick wouldn't pick him as the next guy in charge. But then he's confounded me virtually since I was you know <laughs> since I was eight years old. So so perhaps perhaps he is the right man to do it. I don't know. I just I just think that you know it's incredibly important in the next. I don't know. In the, in these next months, while the one day series is on, beyond the test series, I mean, let's you know, let's just say England are more than likely going to lose this five nil. 
that that decisions are not made off the back of whatever the result is at Sydney and whatever the results. Well, we know what the results have been in the last Test match. That some time is given to make this call. You're obviously the one-day series is going to be there. The players are out there for another month once the Sydney Test match is done. There will be time for this to be to be this decision to be made um, without the, the 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 passion, I suppose, and the uh, you know the, the hot-headedness of what's going on in Australia at the moment. Because I think it's an incredibly important call and uh, and one that needs to be to be given absolutely total consideration before anyone decides to move Andy Flower on. Because I would still be more than happy to see him in charge of the job. There might be some personal changes around him that would be helpful, um, but I, but I don't see a reason for him to stand down at this moment in time. Dan, from again from the Australian perspective, do you do you think England are going to be looking at the Australian selectors bringing in um, someone like Booth and uh, and seeing the lighter touch work for them, and um, and perhaps getting cajoled into doing the same with England by bringing in Ashley Giles, who George and and Butch both described there as being of a slightly lighter disposition than than Andy Flower. Perhaps that's not too hard. But I mean, do, do you think that there is a, a possibility that that's that's going to be the way that they're looking at it at the moment? Well, it's fascinating how the cycles work in in cricket. That you know, for for years and years, uh, England was um, uh, you know gnashing its teeth over its own results and saying we've got to copy Australia, we've got to do this, we've got to do that. The last four years, Australia has been saying we've got to take after England. Darren Lehman himself, at the end of the uh, at the end of the Melbourne Test, um, I asked him about uh, about Andy Flower and and how you know how he he saw. His position right at the at the moment, and he said, "Well, look, um, I've you know I've, I've make no bones about the fact that we've you know we've tried to copy a lot of what what Andy and, and his team have have done in what in what we're doing in Australian cricket. So um, you know, whenever whenever the uh, whenever the the opposition is is winning and, and you're not, you look at you look at what they're doing and you you try to pick out the things that are going to um, going to aid your aid your cause. But then again." Um, it's also important to recognise what you do well, and uh, and to follow that up with um, uh, you know with with planning and with and with thought processes that are that are going to work for you rather than um, just saying well you know we've got the Australians you know loving life again we we need we need to have a we need to have a um, a guy who's going to um, uh, have a joke of the day in uh, in our dressing room I think yeah there's a little bit more to it than uh, than that but you know the as George has said, the um, uh, the fact is that uh, England in this series have looked um, they've looked weary. They've just looked weary, and whether it's it's weary about the amount of cricket they've played, weary about what Andy's been saying to them, and it's not necessarily getting through, um, or weary because they they've been a very very good team that's had success over a number of years, and you know maybe you know perhaps not quite as hungry as they were. Um, two or three years ago. Well, but perhaps none have looked so weary as, as the captain, Alistair Cook, who looked relatively bereft of ideas in the fourth day um, of the test match uh, in uh, the MCG. Butch, I know that you have been quite critical uh, of Cook's captaincy um, during this series, but, but also beforehand. Um, now, as far as changes are being concerned, do you feel that that needs to be a change that is made by England? If there were an outstanding t candidate to to take on the role, and 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 by that I mean the role on and off the field, um, in terms, you know, th there's an ambassadorial side to being England captain as much as there is on the field. Then, then yeah, I would say absolutely, 100%, do it now, um, because because the suspicion has always been there that, that as a as a captain, he he just doesn't. He really doesn't read the game very well, um, but that he's been able to that, that England's results have been good because the senior because they've scored mountains of runs and their bowlers have bowled people out. Fine, that's sensational. That's all you need. Um, but you know that that was kind of the final straw for me. The, the last day of that that Test match where it was it was awful. It really was. Um, but. Who do, who who in the in the squad at the moment would you say right now that here's somebody that's going to take it forward for for the next four three or four years as Test match captain? Here's a here's somebody that we can rely on to be um, you know to be the, the the type of person that that captains England over a period of time. And I don't think there's one there. 
Um, so therefore, almost by default, Alistair gets to stays in the job, and hopefully, you know, goes out and buys Mike Brearley's <laughs> Mike Brearley's Art of Captaincy book and spends a long time sitting there reading it and trying to understand and trying to trying to get his head into the subtleties of of the game and and of of trying to be one step ahead of, as opposed to three steps behind all the time. I, I have to, I have um, a personal experience of reading Mike. Really, Art of Captaincy. Just before I captained my uh, my under 13s team, and at the end of that, season, we played 10, won one, lost nine. So, um, <laughs> I, um, <laughs> um, myself. Um, but now, George, on the on the, the serious point of England captain, I don't think you necessarily agree that that you think that Cook should go, even though there isn't um, someone who does fit in the role anyway. I, I think. There are people who could do the job, actually. I think there are three pretty obvious candidates. Kevin Peterson, uh, Ian Bell, who's uh, an exceptional captain at domestic level. I don't know whether he could transfer that. I don't know whether he'd have the confidence to do it, but if he did, he would be. And Stuart Broad, who I think is actually a good captain. Whether he's got the ambassadorial qualities, I think he probably has, to be fair. But uh, Alistair Cook is learning his trade at a very, very difficult level to learn your trade of captaincy. And he's not always brilliant. I didn't think he was so bad as Butch did in the fourth day. I thought, you know, had the catches stuck, it all looks a bit different. And I shared his lack of faith in Monty, I have to say. Who, you know, I thought his bowling was remarkable. Uh, his bowling left our medium pace now. He looks just like Michael Yardy to me. And um, I, so I, I thought he was a bit unfortunate that uh, you know they created chances and didn't catch them. But one of the in interesting things is talking to Andy Flower yesterday. Just going back to that, he he defended the, he defends the captain, he defends himself, he defends all the coaches. Now I admire that loyalty. I, of course I do. It's a wonderful quality. But this isn't good enough, and something does have to change. Now it's not a knee-jerk reaction because it's been it's been since March since they scored 400. Now, I think they sent out some very mixed messages by dropping Nick Compton for scoring slowly and, and various other reasons, of course. The last time they scored 400, Nick Compton got 100. Now, I, I think that's quite damning. I think there have been a series of errors, and I think they actually all do come back to Andy Flowers' door. Uh, the captaincy thing, I think, is a bit of a red herring. Uh, I thought he batted much better, <coughs> and if he bats well, he'll lead better because he's that sort of captain. Bless you, Bruno. Um, he's a lead from the front captain. And I thought a year ago, his leadership in India was exceptional. He's not a tactical genius. He is no Brearley. There's a lot of you know captains who would be better in that respect. But there are different ways to lead. And he was the guy who instigated the peace talks, if you like, with Kevin Peterson. Now, that showed strength and quality. It was him who turned things around in Ahmedabad with that second inning century. And him who led them to a, remar a remarkable success there, to the brink of their first global ODI trophy. Now, you could also say that Flowers involved in a lot of that, and of course he was. <laughs> well, he is. But I, but, well, well, he is. Yeah, of course. Uh, and um, you, you would have to say that Cook, though, is a player who is definitely going to be in the side. You know, he's just become the youngest ever man to 8,000 test runs. He's still, I think, the future. He's learning his trade. I would stick with him personally. I, I understand it doesn't always look good, but I'll just say again, had they caught those three chances that went down, what was it, before lunch on the fourth day, I think it all looks a little bit different. And I don't think tactically he was uh, as bad as is being made out. He's clearly not a tactical genius, but he's learning his trade. I think we've got to give him a little bit of time. And I think, as I say again, there are, there are different ways to lead. And, and I do think he's very respected by the squad. Now, whether you could put Kevin Peterson back into a captaincy position, I doubt you could. It's just no, too contentious, isn't it? Of course, of course you can't. Uh, I think he'd be very good. Yeah, of course you can't, you think? Yeah. Of course you Yeah, can't. well, there you are. So, I mean, that... that uh, well, I don't know. I, I, I think he's, he would still have something to offer, but I think most people would agree with you, Butch, yeah. And then that leaves Ian Bell and Stuart Broad, and you could make arguments against both of them. So, personally, I'd stick with Cook. Are we going to stick with Cook? Um, and, and I don't think that Butch felt that the, the other three candidates possibly um, are as excellent as necessarily. <laughs> well, that, Jono, Jono, I think, I, 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 think he'll, I think he'll stay in the job. And as I said, I think it's a little bit by default. I think, you know, the, 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 the point that George makes about his batting is also, you know, is also very, very 
pertinent because um, you know he's averaged what I don't know twenty twenties in the in this series. The only time he's actually averaged more than in the twenties in, in Ashes series was ten eleven. The only time, um, you know. So his his lack of runs is also hurting the team. Now whether that's linked to the captaincy, I don't know because as George rightly points out in India, he was magnificent in his first series. But in your first series in the job, you're not carrying around the weight of the captaincy um, as much yeah, as you yeah. are as you get into it, particularly with ten. Ashes Test matches. So whether that's affected him, I don't know. That's that that's that be for him and his psychologist to to, to talk through. Um, but it is absolutely significant that it, that if England don't make big scores, Nick Compton aside, Alistair Cook is a major part of that. So if we're if we're missing out on his batting, his captaincy does you know his captaincy doesn't make him worth his place in the side. So I'd much rather see him score massive hundreds than uh, than captain by committee and sort of you know chase the ball around. The field as he seems to do. I mean, one one thing that I I, I wanted to, to throw in there regarding uh, Cook is that um, he seems to me to be an excellent uh, an excellent leader um, in most areas except uh, on the field. As Butch says, three overs behind rather than two overs ahead. Um, I'm wondering if there's maybe cause for England to um, have a look at look at their leadership structure and decide. Um, <clears throat> Apart from Alistair Cook, who's the sharpest tactical brain they've got in the team? Um, install him as vice captain, have him next to Alistair Cook as much as possible in the field, and have him sort of give Alistair a little bit of guidance on um, on uh, you know where the game is going in a you know out out in the out in the field and, and try to get a little bit of that dynamic going. I mean, one of the things about uh, Ricky Ponting that people often forget. Um, you know, he's he's gone down in history as someone not unlike Alistair Cook, a great leader um, off the field, a great example to his to his men, but not necessarily the sharpest tactician. Um, some of his best captaincy moments came when he had Darren Lehman as his vice captain in 2004 in uh, in Sri Lanka, and uh, he was injured in India, but Darren Lehman was still the vice captain to Adam Gilchrist, um, and that sharp tactical brain in the deputy uh, was um, was very much valued and, and very useful in. Um, uh, bringing out the uh, the best possible results. Isn't it all the, also the, a question of the players that you have around you and, and the way they're performing? Though, in that I wouldn't necessarily say that Andrew Strauss was the most was the sharpest tactician, but he was a great ambassador for the England team. And Cooks almost followed on from him. But unfortunately, those players who were performing at the peak of their powers for Strauss and therefore winning Test matches have been on the wane. And as a consequence, Cooks' captaincy looks flawed because, it, like Strauss, he has never been a great captain. I mean, Strauss's captaincy was possibly slightly exposed in his last series against South Africa in that respect. And does it mean, George, that I mean, England have slightly lost sight on the importance of a captain in a side, that they've, they've invested so much in the ambassadorial side that they've forgotten about the tactical side? From I don't know. Uh, it, well, there are a couple of things there. One, I mean, the, Cook has to learn at this level because he's not really played a lot of domestic cricket and obviously hasn't played, uh, hasn't captained at that level, or very little captaincy experience George, before captain in England. I mean, that's matches, tough. A hundred test matches. You'd yeah, have, he has, have some yeah. sort of idea about how it works by now. Well, I think he's got some sort of idea, but I do agree that he's got a fairly traditional idea. But if you have a decent side, you can play fairly traditional cricket with two slips of the gully and all the rest of it. You don't have to be that clever if you've got a good bowling attack doing it for you. And I think so he learned largely from Andrew Strauss who didn't have to be that sophisticated because he had two good seamers, a good spinner you know, and a, a, a batting lineup that was delivering and you can overcomplicate things and I think what England don't have is a captain who's going to make or a coach actually at the moment who is making the sun some of the parts better, but uh, you know, and that is something that's been lost a little bit. That, there isn't that much of that sort of captaincy going on in the in the domestic game either. You know, Rob Key was one who stood out, and as I say, again, Ian Bell stood out in the brief periods that he's done it. But, uh, I, but look, personally, I think it's massively overplayed the, the tactical significance, and I think a lot of it is about lifting players and stuff, but. Why is it that these players are, uh, they are not old, yeah? So Matt Pryor is 31, uh, Grove Swan was only 34, I think KP is 33, uh, uh, Cook I think is 28, 29. Why is it that players who should be at their peak are suddenly playing as if they're over the hill? Why is it that they all are? Why, why is it that, well, so many of them in one squad all seem to be at the same 
out of form state of their career. And, and, and you can't just put this stuff down to luck or form. You can't trust to luck at all, I don't think. And uh, uh, ultimately, someone has to take a bit of responsibility for setting the environment in which these players perform. And I think it does come back down to the captain or the coach. Um, uh, Butch's point about how do you get the best out of Cook's runs is a really fair point. His primary job is to score runs. If the captaincy is shown to be inhibiting that, then he's got to step down as captain. I would agree. I don't think we're at that stage yet. I think, what did he score? Centuries in his first four tests or something as captain? Something like that, wasn't it? Remarkable. So uh, I don't know. I think the evidence is mixed for that right now. Uh, and I don't know the answer. But it, again, for me, that you can make a mountain of evidence that something needs to change. And it tends to come back to the same door. And I, I say this really regretfully as a huge fan of Andy Flower. And I hope the piece that I wrote, you're always writing in a rush. You know, you're always writing in a rush. I hope it was respectful and uh, reluctantly accepting that his race is run. But I, I, I stand by it, I'm afraid. I just look at the, the ODI squad that's been announced because it does look as though the way England's setup is moving is that they're putting their support behind Alistair Cook. Um, and I don't know whether they're putting their support behind Andy Flower. We'll, we'll certainly see that over the over the coming weeks. Um, but but by saying that Alistair Cook's going to be the captain of the one-day international squad for this series against Australia, when you th would have thought after the mauling they've been given, it would have been an excellent opportunity for them to perhaps say to him, you take a, a back seat there. by saying you're going to still be the one day international captain for this uh, one day international series but they're, they're saying to Alistair Cook you're our man till the, the 2015 World Cup and you have our 100% our support in, in both formats one day international and, and test match level that you captain the side at yeah and look I don't have I really don't have a problem with it I don't um, I'm, I'm merely trying to point out the, the you know the, the, the flaws that I as I see them but I don't. I wouldn't. You know, I wouldn't be throwing the throwing the toys out of the pram if if he stayed on as captain for for the next three or four years. I mean, you know, at some point things will turn around and and, and they will get better and he will and he will get better. I, I have no doubt about that. He's not a stupid man. Um, in terms of the one day series, he's kind of he's got to really, hasn't he? Um, because you know it's England's last chance to play in Australian conditions before that World Cup. Um, with the white ball, they still, you know, they still have no idea really what their best 50 side is going to be because ever since Al Ashley Giles has taken over as coach, he's always been given a slightly second string side because, um, you know, the Test team has been resting, resting key players from the 50 over stuff. So they, you know, they 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 need to they, because otherwise we're going to end up with what we always get, which is at half past 11, um, you know, just before the before the final hour. Um, of the World Cup, we're going to end up with a side that no one's seen out in the park before, which has happened in the last four World Cups. So he's got to stay and he's got to play, um, and just hope that the injection of new, you know, the new players that come in for the One Day series will give them all a bit of a lift. And you know, I think also the uh, the team that loses the Ashes tends to go on go on and win the One Day series, which I'm sure will will, will be uh, more than recompense for the misery of the last couple of months. <laughs> 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 but it's what always happens, isn't it? You know. The, the, uh, the 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 Ashes winning side kind of goes on a lap of honour, and the um, you know the the guys that have been thoroughly thrashed end up winning a one day series, and in, a largely insignificant one. Although in this case it's not insignificant for England because of what they've got to do, um, you know, two years down the line. Andrew Andrew uh, Andrew Flintoff is still dining out on winning the tri series in 2007, isn't he? <laughs> no, no, I don't think he is. No. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's starting out on totally different things nowadays. Um, now, Dan, let's take a look at this one day international series very, very briefly because, I mean, how are Australia going to approach it? Are they going to approach it with the same sort of verb that uh, Butch has suggested that England will hopefully uh, approach it? I mean, there are only five players uh, different in the in the English one day international squad from from the Test squad and as a consequence you've got quite a lot of baggage being carried in there by England into this uh, series and although the Australians might be tempted to go on a lap of honour the way that they've they played well in the fourth test the way that they played their cricket so far in the ashes would suggest that perhaps they just want to completely annihilate England and they and and, and put down what would be a marker uh, ahead of the World Cup in two years time. Oh certainly the, the encroaching uh World Cup next uh, next summer is uh, going to add some um, 
add some value and some significance to each of the ODIs that uh, that any team plays from from this point on. Um, one of the most significant things today about the Australian squad that was announced was the uh, continued um, uh, fall from prominence of of Philip Hughes. Uh, wasn't wasn't picked as a as a reserve batsman for the uh, for the Sydney Test. Alex Doolan got the the nod there, and then um, today Hughes wasn't in the one day squad, even though. If you look at his uh, record playing one-day cricket for Australia in the past uh, 12 months, it's actually rather good. Um, and they've uh, they pre preferred to continue on with a Sean Marsh, uh, an Aaron Finch, um, and uh, recalled Dave Warner, which uh, was uh, a fait accompli, I suppose, if you look at uh, how he attacked the uh, the domestic limited overs competition that preceded the Ashes and his form in the Ashes itself. Um, but, yeah, I, I think the... Uh, the Australian, the Australian's goal for this this series will be um, a couple. Of, there'll be a couple of points to it. One is um, continue just that winning, that winning run, that winning winning feeling, um, momentum, and and you know good uh, good vibes among the among the players for each other. Um, they've also got half an eye on South Africa. Um, James Pattinson being picked in the squad is uh, very significant on that score. Um, because the BBL is going on in the background, they don't have any first-class cricket at the moment to uh, to uh, give to James Pattinson to to assess his um, readiness, having come back from uh, from injury. So he's in the one-day squad, having played uh, one BBL game the other night. And um, yeah, I think uh, yeah, the selectors would dearly like to be able to take him to uh, to South Africa as the uh, the next bowler in line after the, uh, the three who performed so well in this series. That's the way things are set up for, for the ODI series. I don't really want to dwell on that too long because we'll have time to, to talk about the One Day International Series um, in, in future shows. Um, let's turn our attention to Sydney. Um, George, um, Mark Nicholas wrote an interesting article on the site where, I mean, we've discussed at length about the, the tour party selection by England where he said that it was a party chosen on arrogance, not a practicality. <laughs> Um, which I, I think we'd all agree on, even even Bretto there, um, just uh, showing exactly what he thinks of England's performance. Um, but uh, let's uh, just turn to, to this, this Sydney Test match, um, and they have flown in some new players, and there's been quite a lot of uh, chat about the, the possibility of Scott Borthwick being blooded in, in this fifth Test match in Sydney, and that Gary Balance might also be blooded there as well. Is there any... Positivity that can, I mean, other than obviously Borthwick coming in and taking a five for a balance scoring a century, but really the likelihood of that happening with the way that this series has gone so far looks fairly minimal. So, as a consequence, are England going to gain anything by blooding players in Sydney where Australia are chasing down a 5 0 test mark? That's a, a really good question, and I guess the answer is you don't want to start from the position they're in. I didn't think their squad was. Uh, uh, arrogantly selected. I, I don't agree with that at all. I, but I do think there was a, a, a sort of disjointedness between the uh, expectation of the selectors and the reality of the management. They should have known, I know Butch could disagree with this, but they should have seen what Tremlett was bowling like in the summer. They should have seen how Monty was bowling in the summer. Uh, they maybe should have had a reserve opener. I think there are some errors there. I mean, basically they've had tall, three tall drinks waiters. Uh, and you have to ask why they're not getting the best out of some of these guys again, people like Finn, special talent. Ultimately, I guess he has to take responsibility as the individual. But, you know, it does seem to keep happening. Now, why would they bring in these young players? Well, I think they accept that the team needs refreshing, but they keep saying it's the team that needs refreshing. A lot of these coaches in the ECB roles have been there for a long time. Look at David Parsons. He was originally a spin bowling coach for the ECB. Tell me the spinners that are coming through. Yeah, I, I would look at that record. Kevin Shine, fast bowling coach. Look at the fast bowling records. They people who uh, they start fast in county cricket and they get slower, like Stuart Meeker, every time they have any association with the ECB in Loughborough. It's a fact. You can actually go to Loughborough and you can see the times they bowled when they first went, and every year they get slower. So I think there are things that need looking at well away from selection. But I think they will play Borthwick. I can. He, he is a. Uh, a decent batsman, you know. He's not playing for his batting, though. He's an okay spinner. He's a leggy. I think he took 28 championship wickets at 38 last season. Super fielder. So I think they might as well. 
a championship, though. I mean, uh, oh, I think okay. it was 28, 30. But uh, you know, well, well, yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um, and um, he, I, I think he's, you know, it, is he going to be selected for the role that they want him to fulfil, or the role that he's good at? So he should be a uh, a bit part spinner, really. I think you, you, if you go into a test with him as your main spinner, you're asking a hell of a lot of him. He's not a bad cricketer by any means. He'll improve the energy in the field. He'll take some catches, and those those are positive things. But what are they asking him to do? I mean, they're asking him to do a hell of a lot. But he'll, he'll improve the tail. Um, I, I would play him rather than Monty, I would. But whether you play Treadwell as well, who took very few wickets at a hell of a cost last season, I don't know. I think they'd murder him if they did. But uh, balanced, talented guy, who do you bring him in instead of? If you bring him in, I guess he's coming in for Carberry, which means you push Root, who's struggling at three, back to the opening position. Again, Root has been messed around. He's been everywhere from one to six or whatever it's been. <laughs> Let him settle. I, I think it's very... They're asking these young guys to do a hell of a lot. Uh, I would probably play Rankin as well um, because, you know, he's been on the tour for ages. You might as well have a look at him instead of Bresnan. So I do think we'll see changes. I'm pretty sure we'll see Borthwick play. Not sure about balance. Rich, are these changes that you want to see? Do you see the danger with them? Um, yeah, I do, but it, I wouldn't. I wouldn't not do it because of because of danger. I mean, you know, what's you haven't got anything to lose particularly. But but um, being that it's Sydney, being the, the the huge role that spin plays in Sydney Test matches, I think to go in to go in with that to leave Monty out under these circumstances basically ends his, ends his career for me. If, you if if they don't trust him to play at Sydney, where they they're, they're going to need a proper spin bowler to bowl the majority of their overs over two innings, then that's it. He's done. So for me, he has to play, and Alistair Cook has to throw him the ball at the earliest opportunity, and um, show a bit of faith in him. And if he and if he lets us down, then you know, then you know he he's not going to be able to uphold the role as England's solo spinner um, to the to the three man or four man pace attack or whatever. And then you start looking elsewhere after that. Um, same with uh, with with Michael Carberry. I'd be inclined to let him to to give him the final Test match of the series. In order to make a case for himself going forward, and if it, if it doesn't work out, then okay, you look again at that position. Um, the batsman that I would give the game off would be Joe Root, because what I don't want England to do is to is to end up shifting him once again in order to accommodate balance, shifting him back up to opening, which they decided he wasn't ready to do at the end of last summer. Um, then Trot goes home, he ends up batting at number three, which is, for me, tougher than opening. Um, and then to move him again in the final test match after a series where he's, you know, he's shown a little bit of, of, his, of his skill and his undoubted quality, but has been totally under the pump, I would just give him the game off and say, get ready for the one-day series and play Gary Balance at number five. Um, those would be the changes that I would make. Um, you know, but Scott Borthwick, I love the idea of Scott Borthwick, I really do. Um, and if and if England felt that they could play two spinners on, a, on what looked like it might be a turning pitch at, uh, at, uh, at, at at Sydney, then then great, stick him in. But I would, there's no point playing him if he's only going to be the, the single spinner and you don't really think that his spin bowling is good enough. It's just asking yourself for an utter hiding. Um, and then you can always leave out Bresnan and play Finn. I'd love to see Finney have a go and just literally just run in and try and wang it down there as fast as he possibly can because you don't you stand to lose nothing. So those those would be the things that I would be looking to do. I, I definitely like to see Finn play again, um, but I just one of my fears about Finn is that actually the damage done to Finn goes all the way back to the 2010-2011 series in Australia, where he was a promising young bowler that some people felt was being perhaps pushed into the Test side a little bit too early. Um, and and he's never, I might be totally wrong about this, but I just feel that he's never recovered from being dropped um, after the third test in, in, in that series. I, I'm getting some echoing <laughs> in the background there. Um, but I mean, basically, I mean, he's ever since then, yeah, he's had little purple patches in certain series. He bowled very well at times in India. But yeah. he's fully come back and I know that there's been all of this time where he's had his run up changed and well, so no, that's that there 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 you have it for me. That's that's the that's the point where I'd start. I'd start with Graham Smith who, you know, even though he's not not playing against England at the moment, is still having a, a detrimental effect on us because that, that whole no ball thing with him banging into the stump then contributed to, to him having to changing his run up, cutting his run up in half then contributed to him not having any rhythm whatsoever and going back to the long run. I mean, from, from that moment onward, 
Um, he's he's not he hasn't had a clue what he's been doing and hasn't bowled anywhere near as quick or as or as straight as we know that he can. So yeah, I mean, well well done, Mr. Smith. You see off England captains and you get rid of their quickest bowlers as well. He's an absolute genius, that man. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Dan, as, as far as you're, you're concerned, um, do you think Australia are going to be, they're pr presumably not going to be too fearful uh, of anyone England are, are bringing into their side, but will they be considering the damage they could do to, to any youngsters like Borthwick, for example, if he is brought in, and the, the fact that they could um, see off his test career in one fell swoop? Well, regarding Scott Borthwick as this uh, you know, young, talented that's from leg spinner, terrific fielder. Sounds a bit like Steve Smith to me. Um, and uh, you know, he was he was thrust into a very similar situation in 2011. And uh, you know, a lot of people wrote him off and thought, oh, he's never going to be good enough. And you know, he's uh, he's he's come quite a way since uh, having had the benefit of that early early exposure to uh, to what the what the level actually is uh, is like. But no, regarding the Australian team, I, I think they um, their major goals this week won't be so much to cause damage to England. It'll be they definitely want to win 5 nil. They want to win it with the same team. They'd really like to pick the same 11 for all five tests. I mean, you know, that would be um, a, a tremendous achievement of itself um, in, the, in an era of, uh, of rotations and, 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 uh, and managing players and, and all, of, all of that. Um, and uh, they also just they, they want to be there at the end of the series to um, to lift up the urn in a way that they've watched England do it for the for the last three uh, the last three series. Something that all of the Australian players have generally made a, a point of um, being out <laughs> being out off the field and being able to um, to take in the sight of their opponents uh, celebrating and um, you know that's really been um, burned into into their. Uh, into their subconscious and, and, a, and a big driving factor behind um, behind their their success in in this series has been the, the hunger to, to not want to see that side again. Brother, I'm going to let you go and get a lemon sip um, because uh, <laughs> you can, sound as though you definitely need one. Um, and um, I'm also going to wrap things up there. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. We'll be back in a few days' time to look back at that uh, New Year's Test match and the the Ashes series as a whole as well, of course. And if we have energy left, then we'll perhaps look forward to, to the One Day International series and the T20s as well. Until then, though, it's um, a very happy New Year to Butch, to Dan, and to George, and to, to all of our viewers as well. Thank you for joining us here on the Switch It Show on ESPNCrickInfo.com. <laughs>